Good afternoon. Welcome to the AGO. I'm Stefan Yost, the Michael and Sonia Kerner Director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario. This afternoon, we're joined by Matthew Teitelbaum, who's the Anne and Graham Gund, Director of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. We'd like to begin these events by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit, which has also been the home to the Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee through time. We're glad you joined us today. We've got about a thousand people uh, listening and signing in and watching um, to these programs. We've received support today from TD's The Ready Challenge. Um, they've been fantastic in helping everybody communicate during this pandemic. And uh, next week we have uh, Franklin Simaras, who's the director of the Perez Art Museum in Miami. Um, that's on June 4th. And on June 11th, we have Ann Pasternick, the director of the Brooklyn Museum. Today's format is really simple. Matthew and I are going to chat for about 25 minutes and then Kathleen and Annie who are behind the scenes will take your questions and feed them to me and we'll have maybe about 10 minutes or so of your questions to answer. Um, so without uh, any further ado, I want to welcome Matthew Teitelbaum and I also want to welcome Ethel Teitelbaum and all her friends. They're, they're watching Matthew's mother. So um, welcome to both of you. Um, I never go anywhere without her. Yeah, no, she's great. She's fantastic. She's kind of the heart and soul of this city. Um, I just, I'm going to jump right in with a question. Obviously, you've been leading through um, the pandemic for these last 10 or so weeks. Uh, what prepared you to lead during this period? Well, first of all, I want to say hello. Hi, Stefan. Hi. Great to be with you and great to be talking. I mean, we've actually seen each other weekly because we're on these calls together with museum directors. And so I'm getting, you know, a real sense of what you're up to. And I have to say, I'm very impressed with what's happening in Toronto. Makes me a little homesick. I mean, it's so thoughtful and you're so engaged with the right issues. You know, I, I think the following, I think nothing prepared us for this. I mean, whatever we did in director school, I don't even know, if, I never went to director school, but in any event, if we did go to director school, it sure didn't prepare us for this. We're making decisions where we don't have the traditional signposts or this traditional uh, analytic tools that would say, if you do this logically, it, it will lead to that. Um, that said, what's getting me through, I think, is a commitment to values, yep. a commitment to staff, a commitment to trying to create an institution that will be sustained in the long term. Uh, one thing that I feel more strongly about than ever, and I've always felt it uh, deeply, is the need for great art museums in civic space. And I think that at this moment, it's never been clearer and never more of an obligation for us as leaders and those who support us to really create an institution that can be sustained. So what, what am I, how am I making decisions? Through a set of values, through a set of what is the right thing to do? Uh, how do we create the context uh, to take the next step? It, do you, how long do you think these changes will, will be with us? Not, not COVID, but the things you're thinking about or the focus on these values now. Do you, because I feel like there's a lot of noise that has just kind of dropped away. Things I worried about before where I'm not worrying about, I'm just worrying on these top things and trying to find a way forward. How long do you think that's going to last before the noise kind of creeps back in? You know, you know what I'd say, Stefan? That's our hardest work. That's the work you and I have to do is to make sure that we create the institution and the culture in our institution that gets sustained in the right way. Yeah. You know, we're working very intensely with Boston Consulting Group to figure out what does the structure of the institution look like going forward? Because we're looking to, for up to 25% reduction in our revenues next year. That's yeah. a serious change the way in which we're gonna work. Um, and as I keep saying to the BCG folks, and by the way, completely in alignment with the way they're thinking, uh, this is about finances, this is about structure, but it's also about culture. Yeah. And if we don't get the culture piece right, which I think really what you're talking about, the, the protocols, the way we make decisions, the way we work together, if we don't get that right, then the other stuff isn't gonna fall into the right sequence for us. So how quickly is it gonna go back? I think it depends on you and I and others in our positions with our team, with our teams, determining what future do we want? What, institute, what kind of institution do we think has to meet the future? And you know, you've been in the conversations, we've had them about how big a shift is this really? Are we yeah. really talking about new institutions? And fundamentally, um, you know, I'm right in the middle. I'm Canadian, I'm right in the middle, right? Like I, I of course there are gonna be substantive changes, but people still want to come into a 
place to experience oh, yeah. art and creativity and how we do that, how we make the changes to process that are necessary uh, when people are, behaviors are changing will be the big challenge for us. Yeah. And, and is what Boston Consulting Group is doing for you, are they working cross sector or are they just working for the MFA Boston? Or? Well, for the amount they're being paid, they should be working with the whole world. That's all I have to tell you. But th that said, um, uh, they're working with us. Yeah. Uh, they're working with us for a year. So they're doing things like employee engagement surveys and, and other projects with us. And, uh, and they are looking a lot at best practice in other institutions. Has it changed how you think about contemporary art? And has it changed how you think about the more traditional art forms as well? No, I, I, not really. I mean, first of all, I mean, I live in contemporary art, which yeah. causes me some problems sometimes. But, you know, I live in that space. So um, uh, I, my first way in is through the notion of what would an artist want? What does an artist think? How can an artist be part of this community? And I don't know that it's any different. I mean, it's always been, I think, a high priority for me in leading an institution. And I think that the imperative is there as it's, as it's always been. I'm fascinated and maybe I'll ask you this question, okay. to ponder how art is gonna change. Like how are artists actually gonna deal with this? And what is the new vocabulary that might come out of this? I don't know if you've had conversations with colleagues or friends about this. And Yeah, I, I mean, I think we've been in a period where particularly contemporary art has been almost on an operatic scale. Um, and sometimes the scale has become more important than what actually how it's done or the message. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that kind of the, the pompous side of it might, might get turned down a little bit. Um, I think there's real questions about our ability to do things globally, uh, not communicate globally, not have global ideas, but, but the idea that these massive shows go from one place to another, you know, economically, that's, that's um, I wonder if sometimes 15,000 square foot shows should really be 5,000 square foot shows, right? You know, just, uh, Meaningful, but maybe a little smaller. Um, right, and then you have to figure out how many people you can get through per hour in a new. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's like yeah, They're all sort of connect. It's 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 always that balance between like driving gait and and you know doing things that you find compelling and meaningful, and hopefully those two things will kind of merge. But you and I were on that call with international museum directors that we had yeah. on a Zoom call about about a month ago. And what really struck me was how similarly, whether it was our Russian colleagues, our French colleagues, or our Danish colleagues, you know, I could go on just to, you know, prove I know geography, but in any event, how much people were thinking about civic space, Yeah. right? This yeah. is the counter to the international, is how do you actually create in your civic and regional space a sense that the institution belongs to you, to those who yes. live there. And I was, you know, even the great national institutions were thinking that way. How do I make it relevant? And I think that's partly connected uh, to what you said, which is we know we're not going to go into another chapter of vast international exchanges, depending on air routes and couriers and all the rest. It's going to be a much more constrained uh, palette, but that's where innovation comes. Yeah, no, and it was, it was interesting on that call Matthew's referring to is it's, I don't know, 50 museum directors from around the world. We get together periodically to chat. Um, and collaborate and think. And you realize the museums that depend on significant global tourism, the New Yorks, the Paris, et cetera, are in many ways hit more profoundly than the, the great museums that are regional, regionally based. You know, I, I like to quip, Toledo, Ohio will be the museum that bounces back quickest because they probably never had more than 5% global tourism at their museum, right? So they, they've played local so long and so well, um, they, they may come back quicker. Um, than people playing globally. Right, but we still have an obligation. Absolutely. To create the meaning in our institutions that people want in their lives today. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a big challenge. We've got to convince people that we're safe, yeah. that we are caring, and that we're giving them content and experiences that they can't get elsewhere. Like, yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but I am so glad that I don't have a Kusama room in my museum. Because <laughs> if I did, like, I'd have to get one person in every four hours. Yeah, 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 that's true. You, you know, you have to give them more than two minutes. Now we'll give them eight <laughs> hours straight. It's just one person a day, right? <laughs> but that idea of how do you get people through a space, you yeah. know, we're about to open, we think, I don't, we'll open, whenever we open, 
a, a, a major exhibition on Jean-Michel Basquiat and the hip hop generation. So yeah. He looks at um, uh, he, his work and his evolution within the context of his peers when he just started out. So by the way, it's going to be the first exhibition of Basquiat's work ever to look at him in relation to his artists of color uh, peer group. And Different. it's going to be pretty rocking. It's going to be great. In fact, he was supposed to open uh, when the AGO board was coming to Boston. Ah. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But um, uh, the really interesting thing is we designed that show before we closed down. Yeah. Now we're thinking about, okay, we're about to reopen whenever that is. We're going to open this show. Yep. What changes do we have to make in the installation? How do we move people through? And getting that sense of confidence and safety in the space is going to be a big challenge. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's interesting. We've uh, the museum sectors has done a bunch of surveys, and um, Matthew and I got a preview of some of the the kind of survey results. Um, it's kind of for all of North America, and and people want other guests to have masks on. They want our staff to have masks. They want to be able to social distance, and they want time tickets um, so that we can limit how many people. The great thing is, is what people want to feel safe are all things we can provide. And I like to quip, you know, we've had we've been cleaning polishing floors incredibly clean and dusting and washing display cases obsessively for, you know, at least a hundred years. So, um, you know, clean interior spaces is something our, our teams do well. They, they know how to do that. Wow. And moving people through space. I mean, I do yeah. think museums are, are well, are well equipped to meet this moment, but I don't think we can underestimate anxiety and concern both for ourselves and for totally. our teams and those who it's, we travel with. So, yeah. We'll we'll all get it as right as we can get it. Yeah, we'll start quietly and we'll we'll see we'll see what what is safe and what is good. You know, Lonnie Lonnie Bunch, who's a big guy at the Smithsonian, has this really nice phrase of uh, it's not an on off switch, it's a dimmer, and the dimmer's yeah. going to go down and the dimmer's going to go up and and I love that phrase because uh, it is true. We're going we're going to create in our own ways the way to calibrate how to change, yeah. how to increase, how to lower as we learn more. And, and we're very well positioned to do that, right? We can have 500 people in, we can have 3,000 people in, we can have 200 people. We'll, we'll kind of, I think, ebb and flow back. Um, can you tell me, uh, okay, we're going through this period, who's an artist that you're looking to now, like saying, yeah, that person has more meaning now than they did pre-COVID? or an object or something in your museum where you're just like, this is, this is incredibly touching at this time. Well, I would say, I would say we're involved in a very big project, uh, which is outside of my uh, expertise in terms of art history, but not out of my expertise in terms of what I aspire to. And that is a complete reconceptualization of our Greek and Roman gallery. Oh yeah. And uh, we have one of the great collections in, in the world and arguably the greatest uh, collection in America, which by the way, means I hope someone from the Met is actually listening. Um, because we founded our collection in the 1870s and it really did acquire some extraordinary things. But the question still holds, uh, and I'm gonna answer your question about this moment. Yeah. The question always holds, why should somebody care? Why should somebody have a response to those objects today? And what I think is interesting about arguing for that, and we're just in the midst of refining some of our interpretation, refining it around the notion of community and democracy, which is how do individuals have their voice? How did they find their voice? How did they come together to create the notion of the, of the civic space is deeply embedded in those objects. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's the core of democracy. It's the core of the notion of how community was formed and defined by it for itself. To have that as a platform today is like, you know, it's more meaningful than it was before. Yeah. Because by the way, you're an American who moved to Canada, yeah, yeah. you moved to America. Um, you know, this is a place of individual rights. This yeah. is a place of, of uh, I'm not saying it's not about democracy, but it has a very different definition of community than I experienced in Toronto. The social contract and, is totally different. Yeah, and yeah. so the notion of, of arguing for this in America and saying there is real value to this notion of community at this moment is, is really meaningful, really yeah. meaningful. It has more energy uh, in this moment. So I always love to give people a chance to plug an artist they love. 
or think are underrepresented or more people should know about. We got a thousand people listening. Who's somebody that Canadian artist in particular that you, you think people should zoom in on? Well, you know, the problem with Canadian artists is that the memory is short. Yep. Right. The greatest artist, um, the two greatest artists that I lived with and shared space and time with were Michael Snow and Patterson Ewing. Yep. I think they are deeply underrecognized. And I know that they're, you know, maybe they'll be on a stamp one day, but in terms of the real uh, energy and um, presentness of their work, never enough, never yep. enough. And I'm yep. deep, and I'm not saying this just because Phil Lynn might be on the, on the call, but you know, I, uh, or for that matter, Charlie Bailey, um, uh, Phil Gustin is somebody who yep. I think about a lot. And I yep. think about him a lot these days because his work is partly about um, the notion of aloneness in relation to others. Mm -hmm. And he was exploring that notion of what it meant to be in your studio, but to communicate with the world. And his work is always that tension between isolation and connection. Yeah. And what, what deeper thing to be thinking about today. So sorry that they're all men. Uh, sorry that they are all um, seemingly artists who have great reputations. I just think great artists uh, deserve the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I agree with Michael Snow. His his global reputation is is smaller than it should be. He's he's well known here, but but you know people don't say Rauschenberg, Michael Snow, right? They they. Um, but you know, I'm also a big believer that art history can be oddly just over time, right? It it, it can sometimes really reveal somebody who's extraordinary just 50 years afterwards. <laughs> Quite. Um, one of the things that, you know, obviously you led the AGO during the transformation project with Frank Gehry and some buildings age well and some buildings don't age particularly well. And I've, I've got to say as somebody now who works in, in this building, it's aging extraordinarily well, particularly Gallery Italia. It, it, it has this extraordinary breathtaking, grand, unexpected, unbelievably warm and yet monumental space. Tell me a little bit about um, when you first kind of realized what Gallery Italia was going to be. Uh, first of all, I want to say um, that what happened in Toronto happened because so many people believed in that possibility. Yep. This was not Frank Gehry and bless his heart and remembering him with, with sadness, Ken Thompson, and it wasn't me. It was a community coming together and believing that we deserved a great building and that we had a content proposition that could reach out to new audiences. By the way, I think we achieved both. So I wanna say that straight up, that this yep. was extraordinary, the number of people who stepped forward uh, to express that belief. Um, uh, I remember once saying, probably too intimate for a thousand people, but I remember once saying to Sarah Milroy, early on in the project, as I started to understand what Gallery Italia could be, uh, that I would sit in that space and cry. And I did, yeah. by myself. Yeah. And I looked at it and I thought, this is what a museum should be, a gathering yeah. space for a community. Yeah. Now. The evolution of Gallery Italia was in part that in relation to an Italian community that helped build Toronto. Yeah. But it was bigger than that, and it is bigger than that. And when I walk through the AGO, which I do whenever I come back to visit my mother, okay, when I come back to visit my mother, I go to the AGO, and apart from the pleasure of seeing staff with whom I worked, and you even came down when I was there last and yeah. brought a holiday cookie. So, I mean, you did the whole, you, you were the whole full service director. Um, uh, uh, it is the building that I think, oh my God, like this really is aging well. And yeah. it is uh, providing that sense of connection. I do remember once uh, having a pretty intense conversation with Frank about bringing the budget down. And I uh, had some suggestions for him because you know, we're all amateur architects. Yeah. And he was aghast, of course, as he should have been with some of the suggestions, but he then argued for what that space meant. And he said to me so clearly, and I experience it every time I'm in that space, this is, the, um, this is the scale of an institution with the soul 
of a home. Yeah. And uh, it unlocked something for me when he said that, because I realized that was what I, the journey I was on. It yeah. was really the journey that Ken Thompson was on. Yeah. Um, to actually make you feel you possess the space. And I feel that about Gallery Italia. One thing I notice, obviously people can, it works really great alone. It works really great with a mass gathering works great for art, works great for weddings. One of the things I notice is that many of the weddings who, that happen at that in, in Gallery Italia um, are weddings of families from different faith traditions. So it's a place, it almost has, the Italian community built a cathedral in some way where people from different faith traditions can join families. Um, and it's, it's kind of powerful in that way where, where, where people are really connecting through marriage, but it changes their relationship to that space and the relationship between the families. It's been hugely successful. Because you do feel you possess it. I think that's- Yeah, you, you feel like you own it. You can, people can come together from different perspectives and be there together as it's theirs. One of the things I, I love about you, Matthew, is um, you, you ask a lot of questions and you spend time guiding conversation through questions, right? So you have, you have you, I've seen you in meetings with, with lots of museum directors and you're, you're framing things through uh, a, a question. Um, so you lead through questions. Where does that come from? Is there somebody in your family? Was it part of your community? Uh, is it something that you, you developed later in life or have you always had that kind of, let's think about it from this perspective or how did you get there? So I would say uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is, um, my father used to say, and he was an artist, uh, too many people uh, do, that is to say they are in the what, when they don't ask the question why. Yeah. Why am I doing this? And that was his search as an artist, was to do what he did out of answering the question of why that was uh, significant. And uh, I remember that conversation with him when I was fairly young. I remember that staying with me. Um, and I'm still somebody who is searching for the why. And it's interesting because sometimes people think my questions are mischievous or they're beside the point. But, it, but what I'm trying to do always is to figure out why are we motivated to do something. Yep. Um, the other thing that, that I developed uh, early on in my professional career, I'm giving you a serious answer. I, I, yeah. I, I don't know why, but here goes. Serious answer is that... Um, and I say this, and I said it so clearly when I came to, to the MFA in Boston, what we don't know is more interesting than what we know. Oh, yeah. By the way, that really frustrated some academic curators who thought that I was therefore not being respectful of what they knew. Oh, interesting. Um, and actually one of them wanted to negotiate with me. What you mean is what you don't know is as interesting as what you know. And I said, no, no, no. Actually, what you don't know is more interesting. And so I'm pushing for that. And I yeah. think that you end up in, in more interesting places. Yeah, I had, I had this extraordinary experience moving to Hawaii where you know, there's all Polynesian culture and very strong Asian uh, collections and unbelievable Asian, Asian collections there. And I really knew almost nothing about it. And then coming here where I had a lot to learn about Canadian art um, and, and I agree, I find what I don't know to be actually just thrilling um, and in somewhat a relief because you, you can't know everything, right? So it's... Let me ask you a question about whether you think you're problem solving in this moment of many variables uh, is different in Canada than you think it would have been had you been the director still yeah. in the United States. Yeah. You think you're yeah. approaching it differently because of the context in which you're working? Yeah, totally. Um, in part because... Um, there's a whole bunch of, of things. I mean, one, quite honestly, is we have um, a, a very unionized staff here. So you have to have a conversation, right? Um, they're, they're full partners in a conversation. In the same way, the expectation, government at all three levels has, you know, the, the Monday after we closed, um, the minister uh, gave me her personal cell phone and said, text me a question if you need help, right? that the Minister of Sport, Culture and Tourism, Lisa McLeod, was sending me her, her phone number in case I needed anything, I should just text her directly. Um, that's extraordinary, where, where I really feel like government, private philanthropy, all of our staff, um, 
we're in it together. Like, let, let's try to make the best decision we can, even if that decision is a pretty hard and awful decision, let's try to, try to make it together. Um, there, obviously, there's, there's more decisions we have to make. It's, it's, not, it's not like a, a rosy period, but I don't, as I like to say, I don't feel like we're an institution in crisis. We're an institution with some huge challenges, but we're not in crisis. Um, so, and I think, I think in the US, you might, one might not have that same confidence um, in the different sectors working together. Um, what's your take? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I don't know whether we're fully out of crisis because I don't know uh, if we're in control of the things that really can shape our future. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder about that. But I do say that we have moved to some degree uh, from crisis to a more thoughtful risk assessment. Yeah. And, um, you know, once you're in risk assessment, you're having just what you're describing, and I, I love the way you're saying it, much better, much more reciprocal conversation. Yeah. If you're in crisis, you're just telling people what to do and plugging the, whatever, you know, whatever the, the, the water is coming through the dam and all that. Um, uh, but when you're actually doing risk assessment, you're talking to people, you're engaged with them, you're, you're balancing one option against another. And we're pretty deep into that at the moment. Yeah. The challenge so, we have is we don't actually know when we're going to reopen. So I've been very skillful recently at saying we have no expectation. We only have plans. And I'll tell you about my plans. Yeah. And by the way, I have three of them. So <laughs> I, 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 my, mine is, we are actually... If on a five day notice, we can reopen the AGO. We've got the masks, we've got the rubber gloves, we've got everything, um, but we just need, the, you know, it, it's again, I think the community rightfully is cautious here about how quick we open. Let's move to some questions. We've got a whole bunch of them here. So it's, it's nice to see we've got an enthusiastic. Uh, the Baltimore Museum announced commitment of funds to focus on work of local artists to Baltimore. Could you indicate a trend in art museums in general? Um, I know from the AGO perspective, you know, we've We've bought about eight hundred thousand dollars worth of art by Canadian artists in the last four months. Just quietly done it, and then we also distributed to over a hundred. Oh, sorry, over uh, we we gave out a hundred thousand uh, dollars to local artists in need. Local meaning Ontario artists. We gave them each artist nine hundred seventy-five bucks, just cash, no strings attached. Uh, quietly um, did that. Some donors thought it was a good idea. I thought it was a good idea just to move it. What are you guys doing for your local art scene? Uh, so at four o'clock, I don't know what time it is now, but at four o'clock we we announced that we're doing a purchase program for contemporary artists, most of them in Boston through uh, uh, Boston galleries, to put money in the hands of artists. We've done it very specifically on the basis that, that we are acquiring works of art yep. collection. And then this is so old news for the AGO that I that I'm embarrassed to actually say it, but we are for the first time ever, and we announced it also at four o'clock doing a free uh, lifetime membership for contemporary artists in our collection. Ah. Nagio's done it for- Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, Nagio yeah. was the first institution to do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that way back in the 60s or early 70s, it was, it was instituted. We have just never done it in Boston. And I finally said, this is the moment to do it. This yeah. is about, you know, the more you give away, the richer you are. So yeah. just do it. And so this announcement went out at four o'clock and we'll see what kind of response we get. So we're putting so, hundreds of thousands of dollars into yeah. contemporary artists. And we're, yeah, we're not going to solve it, but, but we got to do our part, kind of. That's I think, important. Um, while diverse, uh, diversity inclusion has been a priority, you've identified prior to the pandemic, how do you think community engagement initiatives will look going forward as our museums reopen? I think it's going to be different for each institution. Um, I feel strongly as an institution that is uh, notably reliant on earned revenue, that the key to our resetting of our institution and its eventual growth will be in our ability to attract audiences. Yep. Uh, I believe, as you've said, that not only is the movement of art going to change, but tourism is going to change, and we're going to be much more regionally focused than we've been before. Once you say that, you need to have strategies uh, on a community by community basis to encourage people to feel that they belong in your museum. So I believe that issues of diversity and inclusion are gonna be more important than they have been. Um, but you know, <laughs> I went to the Met because we were looking for a new head of learning and community engagement. 
And um, the then director, Sandra Jackson Dumont, uh, said to me, you know, I'm the first African-American ever to report for director in 148 years. Uh, and um, and uh, I left, I walked out of the museum and I said to the two trustees that I was, I was, you know, can you believe it? And then I looked at them and said, geez, we're exactly the same. We're yeah. 148 years old and there's never been an African-American to report for director. So yeah. we have a senior uh, member of our team, head of learning and community engagement, who is African-American reporting to me. That has raised a whole set of issues. And I can only tell you that it's opened up so many positive issues. There's no turning back. We will yeah. be a more diverse uh, staff in the foreseeable future. I mean, it's also the pandemic means that if you have to focus on your local audiences, you know, we serve, we're trying to serve the community who's chosen to make Toronto their home, right? So it's, it's just, it's the right thing to do. Um, obviously, we all have blind spots in terms of how we do it or how we open it up. But um, I, I must say the AGO is richer for the steps that we've taken um, over the last you know, decades, but I also think we've got tons and tons still to do. One of the things, um, because uh, you know, we are we all staff here is on seventy five percent pay for seventy five percent time, and so there's there's a good chunk of our our employees who who actually don't have work. If you're a security guard, you know you, you can't really work from home. That's that's not exactly possible. So we've started something called AGOU, which uh, is basically a lot of our staff are in 26 hours a week of professional development. And um, many of them are learning, you know, the language of the Anishinaabe or uh, Mandarin or French or just taking online courses. Um, and and part of it is is making sure our staffs are are and ourselves are, are broader educated um, and kind of more in a growth mindset because it's hard to do these things, these changes, if you don't have a growth mindset. If you're not open to the change, it's really hard to, to make that change. Right, I think that's deeply true. Listen, Stefan, you tell me one thing, which I've never asked you, which is, is how is Toronto f different than you expected? Because you're talking about the, yeah. the diversity. Yeah. Surely yeah. that must have been, oh my God, no matter what people told me, living here is just different. Yeah, so remember, we moved from Hawaii, um, which is less than 20% European descent, right? So um, it's, it's, Hawaii is primarily, um, you know, there's more people of Filipino descent than European descent in, in, on Oahu. So it, 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 it is more diverse in terms of the numbers of cultures represented here is more diverse. Um, but from a new, it, I, I happened to move here from the one place that actually on many levels has been extraordinarily diverse for a long, long, long time, like since contact. So um, that I think prepared me reasonably well because, um, because you have to acknowledge that there's different truths and different narratives and different stories that have to coexist simultaneously um, when you have a diverse community. What surprised me about Toronto was, I'm not sure that Toronto really understands what's happening here is incredibly amazing. It is about the diversity, it's about the prosperity, it's about the kind of civic infrastructure. Um, you know, you you really have to look hard to try to find, uh, we're not doing it perfectly at all, but I think we're doing it better than almost everybody else, right? And there's been a commitment to civic life um, for a long time, this isn't new. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to make sure that that commitment to civic life is the dominant unifying thing um, as we move forward. So I'm outrageously optimistic about Toronto, but I, I call it sometimes, it's like the six foot one 15 year old. We don't realize how big we are, right? So when I'm in Europe and I'm getting patronized by museum directors who are like, you know, is Toronto like kind of like, you know, and they name some small town in the Midwest and I'm from the Midwest. And I say, well, you know, if it's in the European Union, it would be the third biggest city after London and Paris. Right? And it kind of stops conversations and they're like, oh, right. Um, and it completely flips the, 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 the narrative. But I don't think Toronto realizes how big it is and how influential it is. I thought our deal was that you weren't going to make me homesick. 
Oh, no, well. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's pretty amazing. It, was, uh, um, it took a lot to get us out of Hawaii, but this is one of those things that, um, let's see, uh, in your opinion, what's the difference between the MFA Boston and the AGO, as did Matthew? Uh, the difference institutionally is that, uh, first of all, the MFA has one of the great collections. It does. World. I mean, I mean it, it, not to say the AGO collection isn't extraordinary and I feel deeply connected to it. But it's young but relative to... It's relatively young and the ambition in Boston between 1870 and 1895 was greater than any other city in yep. America, full stop, including New York. It shows in the collection. So I would say uh, my deep connection to what art objects can mean and the history they create uh, on an international scale is just a deep, deep pleasure in Boston that I've not experienced before. Um, uh, and I would say that uh, one of the big things that I'm still working through is that the museum uh, in Toronto existed, as Stefan is saying, in a community of extraordinary diversity and of extraordinary um, uh, public conversation. The MFA does not. The MFA mm -hmm. exists in a binary between African American and white. Uh, not saying that there aren't others, but it's a very deep part of the American experience that I'm understanding uh, a little bit at a time. That inflects everything at the MFA in a way that it did not in my experience, where you were always in Toronto thinking in a multivalent way, in a kaleidoscopic way. Um, you know, in, at the MFA, I feel much more I'm on a teeter totter. So I would say that. And uh, therefore, the way you represent difference is, um, you know, you have to just think about it in a, in a different mindset. And that is different for me. That's, my, that's one of my big learning curves. So moving it to a personal question. And by the way, we could talk about diversity and inclusion and we could, it's, uh, it merits a whole nother conversation. And um, the more I learn, the less I know. Um, uh, Personal question, what's one object that you own, that you and Susan own in your house, that you particularly love? Um, you are, so the, I, I'm buying time here. Your question is, what do we equally love? Would we require it together? Let's just, let's, just, let's just start with, what does Matthew love? And then we'll, we can go to what does Susan love, if you want. It could be the same thing. Um, we went over to have a cup of tea with a, with a retired doctor across the way. He had read something that I posted on an MFA site of a little thumb piano, an African thumb piano, oh, yeah, yeah. which I had when I was a kid. And I wrote about what it meant and how music connects us. And he gave me a thumb piano that wow. he had brought back from Africa 50 years ago. And he, you know, and so that's on the shelf just over there. And he said, um, and he said, I'd like you to have that. So that's a nice moment. Of course, Susan said, why do we want that dirty thing in our house? Like, well, it hasn't been cleaned for a while. But, but in any event, uh, that's an object. And she's very pleased to have it there. Um, we went to an antique mm, fair about two years ago. And there was this little Asian doll that when you move the hands, the head bobs and a tongue comes out. <laughs> and uh, we loved it and we have it and every so often we go over and together hit the, the hand so the tongue comes out. So oh, I don't know. Are they the most important things in our collection? Absolutely not. You know, our Rembrandts and our Vermeer painting is much more important. Oh but, yeah, um, it is. Those, those, those are things that <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, um, I just want to thank you very much for joining us in this conversation. And um, I hope you have a great spring and maintain a sense of humor through this all. So thank you very much, Matthew. Well, thanks, Stefan, for being a great host. And to everybody that's out there, I miss you and I hope you're all well. Thank you. Bye-bye.